Alec Murdoch has been charged with the unthinkable, the execution-style murders of his wife and son. But what makes this even more shocking is who Alec Murdoch is and the history of his family in the low country of South Carolina. His family's prominence in the legal community began 100 years ago with his great-grandfather who served as solicitor. This continued with each generation that followed. Alec, likewise, was a successful lawyer. He enjoyed immense power, privilege, and influence until his world began to unravel. Drug addiction, allegations of stealing from his law firm and his clients, and another allegation of staging his own attempted murder. Tonight, the judge has denied the requested gag order, and we will speak with some of the locals from the Low Country who know a lot about Alec Murdoch, his family, and all the allegations of wrongdoing. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here in Closing Arguments, live from New York City tonight. And when you think about the cases that we cover, the trials that you watch on Court TV, there's all different types of cases. Some are a little more straightforward than others. Some are just simple crimes, right? Someone does something to someone or someone takes something, and you can figure it out. There's not, there's not a lot of depth to it. It's, it's, it's what you see a lot in many of the videos that we show you. Someone breaking into a store and stealing some, some jewelry, whatever. There are simple, simple cases. Then there are other cases, like the case of the doomsday couple, Lori Vallow Daybell and her husband Chad Daybell, that are much more complicated. There's a lot more depth, a lot of layers to it. And it takes you a while to really figure out what is happening why it's happening and what it all means with the doomsday couple which will be the biggest trial of 2023 there are uh piles of bodies and 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 this allegation of of the doomsday was coming and the kids were possessed and it, it's it's an awful case we're not talking about that one tonight and you can't talk about it or describe it in two minutes because of how complicated it is. This hour, we're going to talk about a case involving uh, a mother and a son who were shot and killed. Maggie and Paul Murdoch. What happened to them and why it happened and all the surrounding circumstances aren't that simple in this case. Not simple at all. I mean, these two were members of, of a, a very prominent family in the low country of South Carolina. They have money, privilege, power, the ability to do whatever they wanted to do in, in their lives, and were living a nice life, nice lives. But there was a lot of things that happened, and a lot of them focus on her wife, his father. His name is Alec Murdoch, and this guy is one complicated character. You know, what, what happened? His great-grandfather started this incredible tradition of legal prominence in, in this part of South Carolina where they were the prosecutor. They had the big law firm. Uh, they made lots of money, and he made lots of money. But all that's gone now. That whole life is gone because he's now behind bars, charged with the murder of his wife and his son. Here he is inside the courtroom. Richard Ellen Murdoch, if that is your name, please raise your right hand. Do you waive reading of the indictments? Yes, sir. What say you, Richard Ellen Murdoch, are you guilty or not guilty of the felonies wherein you stand indicted? Not guilty. How shall you be tried? By God and my country. Thank you. And Alec Murdoch will be tried by God and his country for double murder, but there's a lot more to this story. I said he was a complicated character. I mean, just, just the legal issues that he's dealing with now are incredibly complicated. And tonight we're gonna take some time to try to understand a little bit better who Alec Murdoch was, 
who he is and what exactly is going on down in the low country of South Carolina. Let me bring in our special guest joining us, uh, Jared Newman, criminal defense attorney down in Port Royal, South Carolina, has known Alec Murdoch since he was 17 years old. Also with us tonight, Matt Harris um, has an incredible podcast, the Murdoch podcast, Impact of Influence, knows all the ins and outs of this case. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Great to have you here. Um, Jared, I want to start with you. Uh, Alec Murdoch, 17 years old. That was a while ago. Who was he back then? Well, he was, he was just a kid. I met him when I was a deputy sheriff on Hilton Head. Um, no particular circumstances, uh, young kids out late at night and, uh, took his ID, found out who he was and, um, uh, just basically told him y'all need to go home. Like I'd done to hundreds of other kids in a resort area, um, and lost touch for him for uh, a while, obviously went off, went to law school. I worked for his father from, uh, 1989 to 1993, uh, and would see him on occasions when I had to go to Hampton. And of course, when he became a lawyer, we basically were in the same legal circles. So explain to me, because you said you saw his ID and then you saw who he was, right? So uh, that tells me something. Tell me a little bit about the Murdoch family and, and what it means when you see someone's ID and they're a Murdoch in that part uh, of South Carolina. Well, you know, being a deputy sheriff, I've been in court with his father. They're uh, very distinctive looking. I didn't need to see his ID. I, I could tell that that, that was uh, a Murdoch. I didn't know which one. I'd never met Alec before. Um, he's very polite, and I, I sent them on their way. Um, Matt Harris, this, you know, I've looked at this case, and I'm, and I'm you know, it, it just seems to me this is someone who, had an opportunity to have it all the the, the privilege the power mm -hmm. uh the influence and just a, a great life and really a great part of the country i've been down there it is absolutely beautiful uh down there in south carolina from your perspective when you if you had to describe alec murdoch to someone how, how would you do that now that with what we know there's no question a greedy maniac uh, just a cutthroat, greedy man who didn't care who got in his way when he was in search of money, who he ripped off, uh, no matter their circumstances in life, no matter how close they were to the Murdochs, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you were a state trooper. It didn't matter if you were a paraplegic. And Alec had a chance to get your money, he would take your money. And, uh, Matt, what what is, is it... Pure greed? Was there something else that was driving it, or was it just the, the, the need for the for the money? That's what I think we're still going to have to find out. And what was completely driving this, they talk about an opioid addiction, but the amount of money, the millions of dollars that he allegedly has taken is way past the amount of opioids that any man can take. And, of course, he's facing some charges now, federal charges with man who's referred to his cousin Eddie as possibly trafficking in opioids. So we don't know who he possibly came across in that business. Uh, I, I think there are still some questions to be asked as to where all that money is and what he did with it. Jared, let me ask you, are you, are you surprised where we are now, right? Because you've known him since 17 years old, right? Um, are you surprised where Alec Murdoch finds himself today? You know, from that kid oh, who was, question. you know, horsing around and now, you know, had, was practicing law, doing all these things, prominent family. Are you shocked? Um, yeah, quite frankly. I mean, uh, yeah, seen him at trial or conventions, in court. Um, I just, uh, I'm not really buying an opioid addiction. I've, I've had clients and I've seen that. But uh, every time I've seen him... Uh, very gregarious, outgoing, uh, personable, and uh, with these allegations, yeah, I was quite shocked. I, I knew that the uh, his son Paul uh, getting that felony DUI and, and killing that poor girl, um, it, it, it really weighed on him. I, I was in court that day that Paul was arraigned, and uh, Alice was trying to be cheerful, but you could tell he was strained. 
And, you know, I look back on it and go, how in the world can he had just had to lead two lives? There's just nothing I can say otherwise. Yeah. So I, I want to follow up on something you said. You're not buying the opioid uh, addiction. And, and again, for folks at home not familiar with the story, um, I've been reporting on this for a while and been talking about it. And I kind of thought that maybe this is someone who got addicted to drugs. Many Americans do. And it just sort of unraveled his life. And he's doing everything he can to feed that addiction. Uh, but Matt's talking about some big numbers that might be beyond what you need yeah. to feed the addiction. Jared, why aren't you buying anything about this opioid addiction? I, I've done all my adult life criminal law, either as a police officer, or a prosecutor with the Murdoch's, or, or a criminal defense attorney. I've seen people hooked on these things. You can't function. Um, and I've never been in a courtroom where I saw Alex in, in a non-functional state. Um, I, I didn't even think he drank that much. We went to bar conventions, you know, beer or two or something. I, I, that, that, it, it's just beyond me because I've had clients that have had that monkey on their back and they, they are pretty much non-functional. Alex, to me, exhibited none of that. Wow. So, so Matt, let me ask you, in all your research and, and trying to uncover what this man's life is all about and how he got here, was there any thing you came across like a point in his life where things changed or do you believe it's just um, part of his DNA, this, this greed and, and more money is never enough money? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, when you have a, a family that is so powerful and has so much influence, it's, it's easy to go off the rails a little bit because you know that you think at least you're not going to be held accountable that you will always escape. There's always the next deal coming in. I can get this money here, move that money over there. I can get this, uh, take this from this person, move it over there. So he, I think he just thought that, hey, I'm, I'm Murdoch. We've been running this show for uh, almost 100 years. Uh, I think that uh, you know, a few million here, a few million there. And then it just snowballed and uh, he really lost his way at some Jared, you, you worked with his father, you said, for, for a number of years at the firm. Uh, I believe this is the firm that his great-grandfather founded many, many years ago. Um, would you call, because, uh, you know, he, I, I, my understanding is he's a plaintiff's attorney, right? Like a, a personal injury attorney. And from the attorneys that I run around, ones that are successful at plaintiff's work make a lot, a lot of money if they are successful. Was he successful, Jared? Was, was he holding up his end? Was he as good as his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather? Um, Alex was certainly a competent attorney, and I, I would like to straighten out with you. I, um, I worked for his father as an assistant solicitor in the prosecutor's office. I did not gotcha. uh, ever work for the gotcha. Murdoch Law Firm. But, um, thanks for, yeah, thanks for clearing that out. Lawyer. Yeah, Alice was a good lawyer. Who pulls their weight in that firm? I, I don't know the inner workings on it. They, they, they've had a half a dozen or so really fine lawyers out of that law firm. So, uh, but but I, the, I did work as a prosecutor. And the way the system was set up for the personal uh, injury and the way the laws were set up, the people would bring their lawsuits, companies, people would bring their lawsuits to Hampton in that area. Uh, it was a short slam dunk win. Companies would settle before they even went to court because the Murdochs, in a way, controlled the jury. The laws were set up. So if there was a railroad accident, say, in Georgia, they would bring that personal injury to Hampton. It was one of the only places you could do that. A, fire, a, a, a truck lost, a, blew out a tire and it crashed in Tennessee. They had the ability to try it in Hampton. It was a really uh, kind of rigged system in that sense, and uh, the Murdochs, you know, worked the system and made a uh, very successful career out of it. This, this is a big point. This, is, this I have not heard before, Matt, so I want to just expand on a little bit. So what you're saying is the, the, the cases that they would get, if they brought them in that part of South Carolina, Hampton County, um, it was like having a home game, right, if, you, if you're playing right. sports. And you got, you've got the home field advantage. So if, if I bring this case, no matter where it's originally from, I bring it here, I have a better chance for, for winning. The insurance companies know. 
the company, the corporations know, so they're just going to pay me uh, a premium settlement. I don't even have to go to court because if I go to court, I'm going to lose. And, and right, that was right. sort of what Alec, Alec Murdoch was, was jumping into? Well, the whole family. I mean, that's how they, they, the law firm, they say that that law firm in that building that you saw pictures of is uh, the house that uh, one of the railroads built. Right? Uh, the fellow attorney can uh, chime in on that, but how it was working. It's one of the few places where you could, you know, have a, a tire, like I said, blow out in Tennessee. It didn't matter if you have a Firestone or a Ford factory. You just had to sell Ford somewhere there, bring the lawsuit there, slam dunk, uh, most cases settled out of court. Fascinating. I mean, it's a great set. So if you've, if you've got that great setup, and you've been doing it for generations. Why? And again, we're getting back to that same question. Why would Alec Murdoch have to do anything else to try to make money? Jared, I'll start with you. I mean, it seems to me that the property, he owned a lot of property. He had, I mean, I, I'm trying to get my hands around why a lawyer, I'm a lawyer too. We know how fragile our licenses can be if you do something wrong. Why would he risk it? Didn't he have a good life, Jared? Oh, yeah, outstanding. Have, you know, silver spoon, everything you got. And what you're talking with, um, Alex, this is generational money, okay? This isn't just, you know, nouveau riche. This has been around. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it, it, it does baffle me. How much, how much do you need? Um, I looked at the cases that, that he settled, and if you looked at the legitimate fees, at least as reported in the news, I'd, I'd be retired right now. Right. Well, you know, you asked the why and what happens, but then again, Bernie Madoff had it made, right? Uh, there are people like that that, uh, you know, it's it's they just see more of that pie that they want, or they made a bad play on this thing, so they got to go get money from over here. Uh, and I think we'll start to find out some more of those potentially bad move that he made. It's amazing. Do we know anything, Matt, about his relationship with his wife? You know, the the defense is painting a, a rosy picture that everything was uh, beautiful in their relationship. There are many reports that she was at the very least, if not looking at uh, the rumors that she was talking to uh, attorneys about divorce, but I, I've heard that she was looking into attorneys to look into the finances because she's, you know, she's starting to get wind of what's going on here. She was getting some checks and some things uh, from uh, Alex made up company. And uh, she may have seen that coming down. Plus, they were supposed to have a financial hearing two or three days after the murders, where a lot of the finances would have been revealed based on the Mallory Beach uh, death civil lawsuits. So when she was murdered that cut off that hearing so things were starting to tighten around uh, alley jared newman matt harris staying with us uh we're talking about alec murdoch the murdoch family murders when we come back we're going to hear alec murdoch's 911 call from the scene where he says he discovered his wife and his son shot plus coming up next hour in Dallas, Texas, a father accused of the brutal murder of his own daughters, a so-called alleged honor killing. Yasser Saeed has been called the devil in court, and today he took the stand to tell his story. Tonight, we have the latest. But Yasser, you did not kill your daughter, did you? For sure did not. double murder trial of Yasser Saeed. The father is accused of murdering his two teenage daughters. Allegedly because he didn't like the boys that they were dating because they weren't Egyptian. The defendant spent 12 years on the run. His flight from justice ended and justice for Amina and Sarah begins. The Honor Killing Trial. Live coverage weekdays, 9, 8 central, only on Court TV. Get up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay. And are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay. And you said it's your wife and your son? 
my wife and my son. Okay, what is her name? Maggie, Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. <laughs> That is Alec Murdoch making the call from the scene of a double murder. The victims, his wife and his son. Now he's charged with their murders. So as you listen to that 911 call, prosecutors are telling you this is fake. This is play acting. That's, that's not real. He's trying to convince the 911 operator that he just got there. And obviously Alec Murdoch has denied the murders has pleaded not guilty and is claiming that's a legitimate call. Uh, still with us tonight, two special guests joining us. Uh, Jared Newman, criminal defense attorney, Port Royal, uh, South Carolina, has known Alec Murdoch since he was 17 when he first came across him. Uh, Matt Harris is also with us, uh, has a great podcast. You need to download and check it out. It's called The Murdoch Family Murders, Impact of Influence. Please check it out. Um, Jared, let me ask you, listening to that, uh, 911 call. I've covered so many murder trials through the years. Many of them start with a 911 call, sometimes from the prosecution, sometimes from the defense, sometimes from both when it's uh, a you know, family sort of situation. What, what struck you and what did you hear in that call? Uh, it's kind of difficult for me to have an opinion on that. I've never seen Alex um, upset. As I told you, I saw him with, with Paul in court. He looked stressed, but I, I, I hadn't seen him in, in, in a, any type of emotional state ever. So I really can't give you an opinion on that. And, and that's fair. And, you know, a lot of people have noted about his voice, and it kind of goes up. And I, I know sometimes when I get emotional, my voice does things that I can't control either. So, you know... Uh, Matt, your thoughts, though, about the, the 911 call. Anything strike you about Alex's uh, call from the scene? Uh, at the time, uh, not a lot jumped out at me because, you know, we, you never want to really try to guess how someone will react when they come upon their wife and son dead. Uh, so it's hard to say how he should have reacted in that. But when he talks about uh, going down to get near the bodies um, and you know he, he at one point he talks about being you know, touching the bodies you wonder like was he was he doing that for a reason was he making sure that he pointed out that he was near uh, Maggie especially because there's word out that he had spat her on him Maggie um, were these things that he just wanted to make known that were very important that people knew okay I was I was down there, I touched that body, I touched that body, I did this. Maybe sometimes giving too much information can yeah. come across as being, hey, you know, he's, he's saying a little too much in, the, in this moment. Um, Matt, can you describe for us the, the property where all this took place, the scene, so folks have sure. a better idea of, of where these murders took place? Um, the property is uh, in Islandton, which is right by Hampton. It's uh, Moselle is what they call the property. So they have a, a house, which is a pretty nice house, but it's a camping, it's a camping area. People come there and they pay, you know, pay or spend some charity events. People go hunting there. This is you know, uh, 3,000 acres, I think. Uh, and then they have dog kennels, which is where we heard Paul's body was found half in and half out of the dog kennels. So they have hunting dogs there. Uh, then they have a shed, which... It's probably 100 yards, maybe, from the dog kennels. Maggie's body, it's been reported, was found about 40 yards from Paul's body, uh, perhaps going back to her car, which would have been by the shed, uh, perhaps. So you have the house, the shed, and the uh, dog kennels. And you have two entrances into Moselle, two different entrances people come in. And the one is the main one where there's a mailbox, and then there's another one. The mailbox one, you would have you would go by uh, the dog kennels on your way But a lot, right, a lot, a lot of uh, land. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking at some pictures now. Uh, again, like I said, beautiful country down there and lots and lots of acres uh, for the Murdochs there. Jared, you've been involved in the criminal justice system down there, uh, as you said, as a deputy, now as a criminal defense attorney. 
Um, what are your thoughts about the double murder trial against Alec Murdoch? Well, I know they want to have it quickly. I don't think you're going to see a trial anytime soon. Um, I I'll probably bet money you're not going to see a trial in 2023, but I, I, I could be wrong. Um, it's a, uh, I'm going to be really interested to see because this case, I believe, since I think there's only one witness, uh, actual, I think you're going to see forensics hard. I think you're going to see cell dumps. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a case based on forensics. To put him at the scene, to, to get him at the scene, because he does have an alibi. He says he was with his father and mother. His father has since passed away. And my understanding, his, his mother um uh is not doing well either so his, uh, he was I with wanna... his mother his father was in a hospital in savannah that night he was with his mother who has uh dementia uh about dementia. 20 minutes yeah he was with her about 20 minutes from moselle okay so he has an alibi but his alibi witness i don't think would be able to testify now I want to play for you another uh, 911 call from Alec Murdoch. This time, however, he's the actual victim, okay? Let's listen. Okay, what's going on? I stopped, I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me, and when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay, were you shot? Yes. But okay. I mean, I'm okay. You shot where? Where were you shot at? Huh? Did they actually shoot you or they tried to shoot you? They shot me, but... Uh, okay, wait, you need EMS? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I, I can't drive. Okay. I'm and I'm bleeding a lot. Where, where part of your body? Uh, I'm not sure. Somewhere on my head. You hear? Somebody just stop for me, ma'am. All right, Matt Harris, for someone who doesn't know the whole story here, give us a little more context about that 911 call we just heard. Okay. Uh, well, Alec had been discovered by his law firm just a couple days before, the day before. It's Labor Day weekend. So he was in a bad place because they booted him out and all that. So he makes this call. And uh, then it comes out that he says that he paid, they call him Cousin Eddie, Eddie Smith, Edward Smith, uh, money as part of a suicide for hire scheme where Eddie was supposed to come and shoot Alec, and Alec would say it was suicide, and his son Buster would get this big life insurance policy. Uh, it then comes out that Eddie says, that's not what happened. That's not at all what happened. He called me to come there. I came there. We you know, kind of wrestled over a gun a little bit. It went off, I left, when I left, he wasn't shot. Uh, then Alec, at this point, says he has the opioid addiction and goes into a rehab facility. That's kind of what happened there in that short period of time. It was insane. Uh, it was insane. Well, I, I said at the top of the hour, he's a complicated character. So uh, to make it less complicated, obviously, we'll keep covering this, this story in this case. But you can check out the Murdoch Family Murders, Impact of Influence, Matt Harris's great uh, podcast. Jared Newman, great criminal defense attorney down there in South Carolina. Appreciate your time as well tonight. I hope you'll both come back because we will continue uh, to talk about this case, uh, working way all the way up to whenever the trial does happen. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about Alec Murdoch and someone who died in his house. Who? His housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. Wait till you hear the details of this one. At Nix.com. What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, you said she's falling. She's bleeding from the head? Yes. Okay. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. 
Okay, so she outside or inside? Outside. Okay. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. That was a 911 call made by Maggie Murdoch, Alec Murdoch's wife. Someone had just fallen down the stairs in their home. That person died. Her name, Gloria Satterfield. Let's put a picture of Gloria up on the screen so you can see exactly who I'm talking about. She had been a family employee for the Murdoch family for more than 20 years, and she died from what authorities said at the time was a fall at the Murdoch estate. This is back in February 26th of 2018. And then years later, and amid numerous lawsuits against Alec Murdoch, the head of the family, um, SLED, SLED SLED, opened a criminal investigation into her death. Here's what the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division uh, said in a statement on, in June of this year. Agents from SLED sought and received permission from the Satterfield family through their attorney to exhume the remains of Gloria Satterfield. This is a complex process that will take weeks, not days. So now, in light of everything else that has been revealed in Alec Murdoch's life, we now have an investigation into a death in his home back in 2018. Let me bring in our guests joining us tonight. Uh, Michael Verzi is a legal ethics attorney uh, joining us from Columbia, South Carolina. He's been involved as an expert in uh, testifying in cases, in some cases involving Murdoch. Eric Bland is also with us. He is the attorney um, for Gloria's sons and estate. He's joining us from Columbia, South Carolina tonight. Uh, Eric and Michael, great to have you both uh, with us here tonight. Eric, I'll begin with you. Um, give me a little more background about what you know, what we know, uh, surrounding the death of Gloria Satterfield, your clients. Well, presumably on February 2nd, 2018, she was going to the house, uh, according to Alex, to get a paycheck. And the reason he said that is because if she was going to work, if she had any type of claim in connection with her fall, it could be within the province of the South Carolina workers' compensation statute, and you wouldn't be able to do a personal injury lawsuit. Alex is the only one who has said how the fall actually happened. He said that when he arrived on the scene after his wife Maggie called him, he propped up Gloria, and she supposedly told him that the dogs who were at the top of the step tripped her. Now, I've been to that uh, Mazelle residence. I have seen the stairs. They are very steep. They are pointed brick. And if she did fall from the top step, she probably would have tumbled backwards twice and would have really um, hurt herself by hitting her head and her body going down the stairs. I personally do not believe that there was foul play in the death of Gloria Satterfield. One, because she was a beloved family member. But two, if somebody was going to kill her, intentionally kill her, they would never have let her live so that she can go in an ambulance and go in a hospital and possibly wake up and tell somebody exactly what happened. I was pushed or I was on a ladder and somebody pushed me down, the, you know, off the ladder. So what I think happened is there was a fall, whether it was caused by dogs or not. But Alex is such a, a crafty criminal by all appearances. He's a serial criminal. And he used this opportunity to enrich himself from the minute he saw it happen. This guy, you know, spends his days trying to figure out how I'm going to build my clients. And so when the fall happened, I think he used it as an opportunity to create a claim against himself, turn it over to his home and homeowners insurance company. And the rest we know is history. He, he stole with the assistance of Corey Fleming, uh, almost $4.3 million, uh, 3.4 million went to himself. So as to whether SLED ultimately exhumes the body and they, de they determine what the cause of death was, I, I just don't believe it's intentional. One, they're not gonna be able to pin it on Alex because the only two witnesses were Maggie and Paul and they're dead. 
But two, if Alex really wanted to kill Maggie, he would have never let her live before 911 uh, was called and the ambulance came because of the danger that she would say, I, I was pushed by somebody. So it was a perfect that, storm point. for him. Perfect storm for him to take advantage of uh, my clients, Tony Satterfield and Brian Harriet. But I don't believe that Alex uh, killed Gloria Satterfield. So just to, just to break it down and, and simplify it a little bit, what we're saying here is that Gloria falls and ends up dying tragically in his home. And he no, she, then died. she died in the hospital. Finny, she died, in the, died hospital. in the hospital, but fell in his home. And then Alec steps in with his legal expertise and figures out a way to sue himself, to help her to sue him, which is really his insurance company, to get the millions from the insurance company, pay zero, and end up profiting from the death of, of Gloria. Did I get that right? Correct. You got that right. Okay. What, what he did, though, is he, he put the, the family in touch with one of his best friends, Corey Fleming, who's also criminally charged by our state, for them to represent um, the boys. What ended up happening, though, is Alex participated in, in crafting the claim. It wasn't really a lawsuit. It was a claim. And it's kind of strange where a defendant has this kind of participation as a lawyer uh, for the parties that are actually making the claim. Michael Yuzzi yeah, this... was our expert witness in this case. Oh, let's, let's bring Michael in. Left. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Michael, it was teed up perfectly by Eric. You guys work well together. Very well together. Um, explain, explain to us, you know, what exactly you believe that Alec Murdoch did wrong that was unethical in this situation where Gloria tragically falls down the stairs. Well, you have five hours. You have? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. It, it's a long list. It starts with exactly what Eric just said, which is participating as plaintiff's attorney in a lawsuit against himself. Right, and taking these people who, who came to him as a lawyer and sending them to his best friend, who was going to look out for, 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 you know, Corey was going to look out for Corey and Alec, not for the clients. Uh, that, that was the start of it. And, and then they, when they got a favorable settlement, uh, they hid it from the family. They did that by substituting the personal representative. Anytime you have a wrongful death uh, uh, survival action, you have to have a personal representative represent the family. And rather than that being one of Gloria's children, uh, Alec had them come in and sign away their rights to do that to uh, another friend at the bank, Chad Westendorf, who didn't do the job of a PR. Chad Westendorf looked out for Corey Fleming and Alec Murdoch and didn't really represent the family. And so by putting another person in to represent the family, the family didn't have to go to court for approval of the settlement, so the family never knew about the settlement. That's one of the ways that, that they hid it from the family. And so, of course, when they got this money, this $4.3 million, the Satterfield family never knew anything about it. And, and was it the, the power and the influence down there that allowed him to kind of sneak this thing through? Um, or Yeah. You have to imagine that, right? It, that, that it has to be the case. He, he goes to Palmetto State Bank, and they do whatever he wants, right? He goes to Chad Westendorf, they do what he wants. His friend Corey does what he wants. Well, Palmetto State Bank wouldn't help him out as much anymore. He went to Bank of America, to the local branch, and they did what he wants. So, yeah, it certainly appears he used his power and influence to get people to help him siphon money away from his clients. Gloria Satterfield was just one in a long list. It was one of the, one of the excuse me, the Satterfield uh, sons who were just you know, one of a long list of clients that he stole a lot of money from in, in some really clever ways. But yeah, it required the assistance of, of banks and another lawyer, and, and presumably he used his influence to get them to help. And, and Eric, you know, um, every time we go ahead, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, he, he not only used his friends to help him out, but he also was familiar with the court system and the judges knew him and that. You know, everybody trusted him. This He comes from a venerable law firm, so nobody's going to suspect that he's doing anything untoward, um, especially the clients who absolutely revered him and had respect for him, not only as a lawyer, but as basically an extended family member. And he had primed the pump with them by telling them, look, we'll make the claim 
and hopefully we'll get enough money to pay your mother's medical bills, which were almost $660,000. And if there's any left over, then it'll go to you. So that the children didn't have an expectation and our siblings, Gloria's siblings, didn't have an expectation that there was gonna be a big recovery of money. And so they, the only way they found this out and the only reason they found this out was because one of our dogged reporters in our state, Mandy Matney, she went to the courthouse and there was one single document filed which indicated that there was a $505,000 settlement, which was the primary insurance policy that he had on his homeowners. There was an excess policy with a company called Nautilus Insurance Company that was for $5 million. But she was the first one to discover it and she wrote an article about it. And so our clients found out about it when they read the newspaper. But Alex had primed the pump and had basically told them, look, I hopefully I'll get enough money to pay the medical bills. Unbelievable. All right, Michael Verzi, Eric Bland staying with us. We got a lot more straight ahead. I have one big question left for both of them. Plus, coming up next hour. On the docket tonight in Glynn County, Georgia, the man who murdered Ahmad Arbery back in federal court being sentenced for his hate crime conviction. I was more anxious to see was he going to address the, the parents of Ahmad and also to the family of Ahmad. And Travis chose not to even say that he was sorry. So yeah. Health. Go to pumpkin.care. Yes, he is an incredibly complicated character. Um, this is Alec Murdoch. We've been talking about him this hour. Still with us, Michael Verzi, Eric Bland, uh, both great attorneys down in South Carolina. Um, Eric, you know, your clients lost lots and lots of money. Others have as well. Here's my question, though. You go after Eric, Alec Murdoch. Does he have any money left? Do we know if he has any money left? Well, we do know that he has money left. We were successful in recovering more than seven and a half million for the Satterfield boys, and we have a four point three million dollar judgment against Alex. So, you know, my our clients have been made as as whole as one could possibly be made in these circumstances. And I've represented other clients and and gotten them whole. I'm currently representing two other clients, the Plyler sisters, and I'm in the process of making them whole. But yes, the answer is he does have money. The court appointed receiver has started to recover some money and property. Uh, we're confident that Alex, who has spent 12 years trying to put himself in a position to hide this money, um, did a good job of it. And we think that there may be money over, uh, out of this country uh, and that's being investigated. And I'm confident that at the end of the day, the victims, uh, through the efforts of um, myself and Justin Bamberg and Mark Tinsley, are going to get pretty much close to being made whole. You never get your uh, dignity back from being betrayed, but financially, I, I believe we're going to get pretty close uh, for all the victims to getting their money back, uh, either through insurance or through Alex's assets, or like what Michael and I did, suing a lot of different people that helped their hand in, in Alex's criminal activities. Absolutely. So, uh, Michael Verzi, I want to uh, draw on your le legal ethics expertise for folks watching at home right now. And let's see if we can if we can draw something good out of all of this, which is um, you hire an attorney, you've been in an accident, whatever. Uh, what are the, some of the signs that things might not be on the up and up with your attorney? You have about 45 seconds. Well, that's really tough for the client to pick apart. That, that, that's something that's going to be really tough for a client to recognize. You know, we, we've seen a number of, of lawyers that steal money from their clients by settling their cases and taking it and never telling the client it settled or telling them it settled for a small fraction of what it actually settled for. And, you know, there's no way for the client to know. There are some jurisdictions where insurance companies are required to directly notify the plaintiff individually when there's a settlement or award. We don't have that in South Carolina. Maybe that could help, but it's tough. Michael Verzi, Eric Bland, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And uh, keep on fighting the fight for those folks who uh, are out money and are deserving of getting